Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody out again, and I see you've all had your coffee, and for those of you out in television, again, we'd just like to welcome you to a short Bible study, and it is short. We hear that over and over, don't we, honey? They just say we know more and get settled in, and it's over, but then that just means you've been interested, because 30 minutes is a long time if you're being bored. So anyway, we appreciate all your letters, we appreciate your phone calls and uh, your contributions, everything. We just know that the Lord uses everything and uh, it's for His honor and for His glory. We just appreciate the fact that uh, so many of you are learning to study and search the scriptures on your own and not just depend on what you hear from the pulpits because after all, a lot of denominational stuff is tradition and uh, you know, more and more, I think, are just taking stuff off the internet to fill a Sunday morning service. So we're not going to do that. We're just going to see what the book says and uh, stay with it verse by verse. All right, we're going to go right on. We pretty much finished Isaiah 51. And now we're going to just jump into 52 verse 1. Now, I trust you all know your Bible well enough that Isaiah 53 is a great explanation of salvation for the Old Testament believers. But it was in such veiled language that nobody really knew what it was talking about until we get to our New Testament revelations and then we can look back and see how graphically correct Isaiah 53 is. But before we get to 53, we want to take a run through 52, which is really leading up to that great chapter. All right, Isaiah 52, uh, verse 1, here is now our third double awake. Wake up, Israel, wake up. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now, what is that a reference to? Well, the kingdom, of course, is in reference here when Christ will rule and reign and Jerusalem will be the capital of it all. But you see, until that time, it is constantly under the heavy boot of the Gentile world. Come back with me. I think it's Luke 21. Luke 21. I hadn't really planned to do this in this program, but it just comes to me that, yeah, Luke 21. This is such an appropriate verse for comparison's sake. Now here the Lord is speaking through the prophet Isaiah that Jerusalem will not have any Gentiles trodden their streets. It's going to be the capital of Israel. All right, but look in Luke 21, verse 24. Luke 21, verse 24. Now this, of course, is a prophecy concerning the Titus invasion and destruction of Jerusalem and then what would follow after 70 A.D.? All right, Luke 21. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Now, if you've got a red-letter edition, this is Jesus speaking in his earthly ministry, and he's speaking of prophetic things out even ahead of his day and time. And speaking of the invasion by Titus, they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations, which of course we know they were, they were dispersed into every nation under heaven after 70 A.D. But now look what's going to happen to Jerusalem compared to Isaiah. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of whom? The Gentiles. Until the time for the Gentile be fulfilled, which of course will be by the time the tribulation ends. So Jerusalem, you want to remember, from time immemorial, has been trodden underfoot by the Gentile armies, one after the other. And even since Titus destroyed Jerusalem, they've come under all of the various empires, the last one of which was Great Britain, whose empire on which the sun never set. So Jerusalem has been under constant Gentile dominion. And even today, even though Israel is relatively a sovereign state, Yet we know that without the Gentile powers, Jerusalem wouldn't survive. But now come back with me to, Jerusalem, to Isaiah 52, the Jerusalem of the kingdom age. 
when Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem, then this becomes as if it's already in place. Henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles, and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. In other words, it's going to be the blood of Christ that will redeem them. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt. See how we keep going back to that, that slavery in Egypt? They went down into Egypt, O captive daughter of Zion. Uh, verse 3, I'm sorry, you've sold yourself, you've been redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. The Assyrian oppressed them caught. Now, I didn't know until I was getting ready for this, and I did some studying, of course, had to prepare. Who do you suppose is referenced here as the Assyrian? Pharaoh. Pharaoh was Assyrian. And evidently, archaeology has proven that. So this is the reference, that while they were in Egypt, the Pharaoh was basically a Syrian. All right, so the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people, see how he's constantly referring to Israel? My people is taken away for nothing. They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Now that evidently is a reference to Israel's enemies. Verse 6, therefore my people, Israel, shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Now here is another description of the God of Israel. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good time. Now of all the times I've heard that verse referenced, I've never heard it referred to as Christ. But that's who it is. It's Christ who is the one with the beautiful feet that brings tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation. See, that can't be anybody but Christ. That saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth, indeed he will someday. Verse 8, thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Now look at verse 9. Once Christ returns and establishes the kingdom and he's got his throne room there in Jerusalem, look at the euphoria of the nation. Break forth into what? Joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He, the Lord, hath redeemed Jerusalem. See all the prospect of his second coming. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Why? Because he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to rule the earth from Jerusalem. See? All right. Then, verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye. Go out from thence, touch no unclean thing, Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For verse 12, you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. Now, you know what I'm thinking? It's a reference back to the flight out of Egypt uh, by a comparison. What a difference. This time, they will go in and out of Jerusalem with complete joy and safety and blessings. All right, now the scripture jumps all the way up to a graphic description of the suffering Messiah, the servant. Behold my servant. Now again, I didn't realize it until I started preparing for this. In every other portion where God says, Behold my servant, the fellow is named. Behold my servant Moses. Behold my servant so-and-so. So here, the name isn't necessary because it's a given. 
There is only one true servant of Jehovah, and that's God himself. So, speaking of the Messiah, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And as many were astonished at thee, his visage. Now, here comes the prophecy concerning the horribleness of the crucifixion. So marred his visage, that is, his visage or his appearance, his facial appearance, was so marred more than any man. Now, you remember, what was part and parcel of his suffering before the crucifixion? They pulled his beard. They ripped his beard. And so, no doubt, his flesh just hung in strips from his face. And he was more marred than any man, and his form more marred than the sons of men. But as a result of that suffering and his exaltation which will follow, even though the verses are reversed, now look at verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now there's probably more than one way you can look at that verse but I think it's really driving it. You want to remember, crucifixion hadn't been invented yet. And this is what I'm always emphasizing. These people back here in the Old Testament were not looking forward to the cross like most of us have been told over the years. How could they? Crucifixion hadn't been invented. Nobody has died a death of crucifixion. The Romans, if I understand right, created crucifixion. So there was no way that these Old Testament patriarchs and believers could look forward to a cross, unheard of. And yet that's what so many people think, that they look forward as we look back. Well, looking back is far different than looking forward, because when we look back, it's a point of history. The Romans crucified literally hundreds, if not thousands of Jews, but nobody had ever heard of it before. And so here we have then the first indication of an intense suffering but also his exaltation. All right, now before we go into Isaiah 53, I want to take you up to the New Testament again and come with me all the way to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I may refer to this more than once going through Isaiah 53 because you have to understand that there was no way that anybody understood that he was on his way to a death by crucifixion throughout his three years of ministry. Nobody suspected that. That was the furthest thing from their mind. But all right, now look what Peter writes in his first epistle, and I'm going to start in verse... Let's start at verse 7, honey. First Peter, chapter 1, we'll just start at verse 7. And we're going to take this slowly. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth in the end, and that your faith, though it be tried with fire. Now you want to remember, when we taught these little epistles, what is Peter preparing the Jewish believers for? The tribulation. And that's the fire that he's talking about the horrors of the testings and the wrath of God that will be poured out upon the whole human race. But Peter is preparing his Jewish believers to be tested with those fires of tribulation, all right? So he says, that you might be tried with fire and might be found under the praise and the honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, there would be an element of Jewish believers who would go through the tribulation and be there to go into the kingdom. Now, it was true then. It's still true in the future. We know there's going to be a remnant of Israel that will survive the horrors of the tribulation and be ready to come up and be the nation starting the millennium. But all right, let's move on. The appearing of Jesus Christ, verse 8, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing. That's faith. Faith is taking God at his word without seeing anything concrete. All right, 
whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, which is what? The salvation of your soul. Now that's setting the stage for his listeners or those who are reading his epistle. The Jew who was a believer at that very time. Now verse 10, he goes back to the Old Testament. Of which salvation that these Jews now had in response to believing that Jesus was the Christ, remember, of which salvation the prophets, the Old Testament writers, inquired and searched diligently. What were they looking for? What Peter and his believers had now witnessed. The whole scope of the plan of salvation, but they couldn't figure it out. And God didn't expect them to. All right, read on. These prophets inquired and searched diligently. These same prophets who prophesied, they foretold of the grace that should come. In other words, a coming redemption, a coming salvation. Now verse 11. These prophets, don't lose the subject. These prophets, searching, that is in the scriptures, what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them and caused them to write what they wrote did signify when it testified beforehand, that is way back in the Old Testament, like we're going to see now in Isaiah 53, when the Spirit caused Isaiah to prophesy the sufferings of Christ, but that's not all, but what? The glory which was to follow. Now you see, we've been seeing that exemplified throughout the book of Isaiah. First the chastisement for their rebellion, and then the blessing. Chastisement, and then blessing. Well, it's going to be the same way. The tribulation is going to be utter chastisement, but going to be followed by what? The most tremendous blessing Israel has ever known. But could the Old Testament prophets put it together? No. They didn't have a clue how this was going to happen. They knew there had to be a suffering Messiah, but they knew there was going to be an exalted and a ruling Messiah, but how it was all going to come together? No, they didn't have a clue, and God didn't expect them to, see? All right? I think that's far enough. Now back up with me to Luke 18. We haven't used that on the program in a long time. Don't think I did anyway. Luke 18. And I always use this as the primary example of how these Old Testament writers could write in latent language the crucifixion, the glory that would follow, and yet the Old Testament prophets couldn't figure it out. Well, maybe this will make it a little easier to understand. Luke 18, verse 31. And this is toward the end of his three years of earthly ministry. In short order, they'll be going up to Jerusalem for Passover and the crucifixion and the resurrection. All right, verse 31. He's still with all twelve up in northern Israel. And he took unto him the twelve, and he said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. But they hadn't figured it out. They couldn't understand what it was talked about. But Jesus knew. And now look what he said. According to prophecy, he will be delivered to the Gentiles. He shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spit it on. They'll scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now he lays it all out in the open. So do the twelve know? No. Next verse. And they, the twelve, understood none. Now don't miss that. They understood none of this. They had no idea he was going to die. Why? Because God hid it from them, supernaturally. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid 
from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Unbelievable? Almost. But you better believe it. Because when they got to Jerusalem several days later, they had no idea what was going to happen. And when they finally saw him on that cross, did they just say, well, take heart. Three days from now he's going to be back. Did they? No. Peter, on the other hand, says, what? I'm going fishing. What? It's all done. Everything collapsed. All their hopes were dashed, see? All right, now come with me to John chapter 19. See, and these are concepts of Scripture that you won't normally hear. And then when the Apostle Paul comes along and says, I've been revealed mysteries, secrets that were held in the mind of God, they ridicule that. That's why they don't like Paul. And that's why I love him. My God chose that man to reveal all these things so that we don't have any doubt. It's there. All we have to do is believe it. But now look at John's Gospel, chapter 19. And uh, you know the account how Mary Magdalene has come to anoint the body, the corpse, and it's gone. And so she finds Peter and John, wherever they were, and runs and tells them that the grave is empty. And they couldn't believe it. So the first thing they thought of what? Grave robbers. They've stolen him. And they've taken him someplace else. All right. Well, let's just take it verse by verse. we got time in it. Verse 4. So they ran both together, Peter and John. And old John outran Peter. And I always have an explanation for that. I think Peter was a young guy in his 20s. I mean, John was a young guy in his 20s. I think Peter was a big, probably a 40-year-old, sort of at the end of his athletic years. And I can just see young John just zipping right by him. And here comes Peter, huffing and puffing a little bit later. And John has already looked in, but being timid, didn't go into the tomb or into the cave. But he saw. Now let's pick it up. So they ran both together, and the other disciple, John, outran Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying. Wow. So he hadn't been just totally kidnapped, if we'd say, or stolen. The evidence that the linen clothes were there, but he didn't have the gall to go in. Now verse 6. Here comes Simon Peter. And he went into the sepulcher. He didn't even think twice. He just barges right in and looks at all the evidence, the linen clothes. And then, verse 7, he sees the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in the place by itself. So he could tell that there was order to all this. It wasn't a haphazard grave robbery. Now then, verse 8. Then went in also the other disciple, John, who came first to the sepulcher. Now watch this. He saw the evidence. And then he what? <coughs> Believed. They had no idea he was going to be raised from the dead. They had no idea he was going to be crucified. But when they saw the evidence, they believed. Now look at the next verse. For as yet, up until that point in time, after his three years of earthly ministry, after telling him that, he would be cru uh, that he'd be put to death and be raised the third day, as yet Peter and John knew not the Scripture. Now, can I make it any plainer? They didn't know that Isaiah 53 was speaking of a death of their Messiah, nor were they supposed to. God was just putting that back in there, I think, for every human being on this side of the cross to now go back, as we're going to do in the next program, if not in this one, go back and read these graphic statements in Isaiah 53 and say, here, this was written 700 years before it happened, and it all fell in place. What kind of a book is this? Well, it's the Word of God. And that's why we have to rest on it, see? All right, so read it again, verse 9. For as yet they, Peter and John, knew not the Scripture, the Old Testament, that he must rise again from the dead. Now, let's go back in the couple minutes we have left and get started at least on Isaiah 53. 
Isaiah 53. Now remember all these verses we just read. Peter writes that these Old Testament prophets had no kind of a clue as to how all this was going to happen. They understood there had to be a suffering Savior. They understood there would be a ruling monarch, glorious beyond human comprehension. But who and how and when, they did not have a clue. All right, so now let's just start Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? Is it any different today? My, we can talk about, we can teach all these end time events that are taking place around us. What percentage of even America, the only near godly nation left on earth, and what percentage of even America believes a word we say? Not many. Europe is a basket case spiritually. Forget about them. And for goodness sakes, don't fall for their system of government. They have got those people so wrapped up in regulations and red tape that they can't even breathe. And yet everybody thinks we got to be like Europe. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But see, that's the world tonight. They don't believe the things that this book declares. Israel was no different. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, now here comes that latent kind of language that Israel, I think, should have understood, but they didn't. For he, now remember, we're talking constantly about the Messiah in this chapter. Jesus of Nazareth as we know of him from this side of the cross. Verse 2 again, For he, the Messiah, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now I think a lot of folks have misconstrued that to think that he had no physical appearance that would attract people. I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. Well, we're going to have to kind of wind down our times if I've gone, and we'll pick it up in our next program. And we're going to make a, a scriptural reference to this when we come back. But here we're talking about the Messiah who would not come in as a great ruling son of an emperor and think that, but he's going to come back with no real credentials to magnify himself. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.